I'm Scott Allen Miller, and welcome to my show where we talk about relocation, living abroad, the expat life, being a digital nomad, and more. Today, I want to focus on something very important that very few people ever actually really stop and intentionally think about, and that is, what really are the decision factors that you should be thinking about when you're starting to make some plans for where you might want to move abroad. In many cases, we approach things from a, here's a country I've heard about, here's a place someone's telling me about, and, and I really need to look into that place. But how often do we actually to sit down and say, well, what factors really matter to me, my family, whoever is moving with us, and determine these are the things we should be carefully looking for, at, whether it's why we're looking at leaving one place that doesn't offer the things that we want, or why we're moving to another place, because it, it does offer something that really attracts us. Have we put those things into some kind of meaningful framework so that we can make really good logical decisions about what is realistically one of the handful of truly massive decisions we will make in our lives. All right, we're going to talk about that right after the book. First up, I want to say what prompted today's video. So I watch a lot of relocation videos, as you can imagine, and a lot of my audience share them with me and ask for my thoughts on them and so forth. And in a recent one I was looking at, I was really surprised because they did a list of why they chose one country over another. And in that list, it was an awful lot of things that didn't seem like they would actually matter to someone really moving. And I thought it was interesting to see how people think about the relocation process, because it was very different than how I did, for one. But also, I think that there's a logical way to do it and an emotional way to do it. And relocation is a big thing. Now on this channel, we do talk a lot about how making a relocation move is not necessarily the biggest decision you'll ever make in your life. You can change that decision in the future under normal circumstances. It is not absolutely permanent and you should be a lot more flexible and like just make the move, make the jump. Don't let uh, decision paralysis stop you from ever being able to move abroad because you can't find the absolute perfect place or you can't quite make that final decision. Just give it a try because you can switch your location within the country you choose. You can switch countries. The ability to move the first time implies that you'll probably have the ability to move a second time. And honestly, each time you move, it will get that much easier. So I was because I was watching this video and thought to myself, these are truly terrible reasons to pick one country over another. These are not things that normal people should ever evaluate on. And many of them were just incorrect. Like the, the actual evaluation of them was incorrect based on the places they had gone. It, it really showed, I think, that if people need to think about this because it's a one time for most people, lifetime decision to do this. And so very few people are gonna sit down and really say, how should I? make these decisions. And two, there are extremely rare, in fact, I know of none, I know of no channel, I know of no service that does what my channel does. So we don't have a service, we're just a channel, we're just what you see here, or you know, you can call me, because that's like it. Like there's no, there's no further thing. We don't sell a, a service to, to really help people move anywhere. We don't have a specific country. Yes, there's the country I live in and we talk about it a lot, but it's just coincidental that that's the place that I live and I'm really passionate about it. So we talk about that on the channel a lot, but it, from a, from a, general relocation standpoint, there are extremely few resources out there that go to that high level and say, we just want to help you relocate, just help you find your future home better. Everyone's always basing it on, well, here's the place where we are. Here's the place where I sell a service. Here's the place where I'm paid to do something. You got to go there. And, and sure, those are useful once you've made that final decision. But if you haven't made that final decision, if you don't know for sure where it is you want to go, those things are going to be more misleading than helpful. So let's step back and talk about how do we actually make this decision. I'm going to be moving around the garden a little bit as the sun changes today. So when we're looking at relocation, we really need to focus on big things that are going to actually affect the majority of our lives. Now, of course, if you're looking at a relocation that uh, you think is only going to last maybe six months or two years, okay, then you need to look at things that are going to affect you during that time period and not for the rest of your life. But in general, when you're looking at relocation, you need to look at the big picture things and, and what's really easy to look at is the very small things, because they're the things that are going to affect you potentially tomorrow, but they may not be really smart factors in relocation. And this is what we saw in the video. 
To give you a little bit of background, though, about how I and my family went about our relocation decisions. So my wife and I, long before we had children, talked about how we wanted to move abroad just in general. We wanted the adventure of it. We wanted to see the world. And uh, one of just the things I didn't want was to continue living in the country I was born in. And I mean that in like a uh, algebraic way, not that specifically the country I was born in, I didn't like and wanted to move away. I, whatever country I was originally from, that was not going to be a country that I wanted to spend the rest of my life in. Why? Because I like every day being a cultural experience. I like just exploring the world. I like having the adventure of being in a new place. So it doesn't matter whether I was born in Canada or born in Germany or born in South Africa. I would have wanted to spend the majority of my life in a different country so that I could be constantly immersed in new language and experience and people and, and learn more and have more scope. That's just who I am. That was a personal drive for me. Most of you are not going to have that. That's a pretty unique one, but some people have that. Everyone has their own reasons for moving abroad. So the first thing is really you want to have a little bit of a what's driving me. Maybe it's just interest. Maybe it's opportunity. Maybe it's career. Maybe it's a disenfranchisement with the place where you're currently living. Could be anything. And generally for most people, it's a combination of a lot of factors, right? Well, I don't, I, I'm starting to have some, you know, emotional feelings that where I'm living currently isn't meeting my needs and some places just look really nice or a big one. I'm from Canada. It snows a lot and this place doesn't snow a lot. That's great, right? Write those things down. Start taking notes. What is driving you to, to even start this decision? So my wife and I started with this many, many, many years ago. And we did lots of research casually long before we were ready. We didn't have uh, the financial position or we didn't think so. That was a mistake. We made lots of mistakes along the way. And that's one of the reasons that I make this show is because we made so many mistakes, but we learned so much from it. And I want you guys to save yourself from as many mistakes as you can. Stand on the, the shoulders of the work we did for, for us and our family and for many others. We've, I've been helping people relocate just because people come to me, friends, right? People who know me personally and, and say, you know, Scott, you've done a lot of relocation advice for me, right? So it ended up that we ended up helping lots of people move as well. And it's become just, so I love making this channel and helping people with that. So this is all, you know, you got questions, you know, you have exact, like you have specific questions for yourself. Get down in the comments, ask away, or look in our show notes. There's information on how to send in a video question. Please do that. I know that this video is going to bring a lot of new people uh, compared to our, our normal videos. So absolutely, if you're new to the show, feel absolutely free to ask me questions in the show notes. But if you would send in a video of yourself, all the information is down below. We will potentially add you to the show uh, and actually show you and, and answer the question that way. That would be fantastic. It'd be super interesting to do that. So we had this initial like we're gonna move abroad. So we always did a little bit of research and we had a list of places that, as most people do, really interesting to us. And so we thought about those things for a long time, but we were wrong on a lot of points. We were really thinking Southern South America and Europe as our main potential locations. There's places that ended up being really good for us and we just didn't picture in our, in our imagination of where we thought we would wanna be. When we then got to a point later that we had our kids, our kids were old enough to potentially live abroad or start looking abroad, we decided to do some fact finding and this was absolutely fantastic. We ended up being able to schedule a long period of time to go to Europe and, and go to a large geographic area and explore specifically places we were potentially interesting, places we had done research for and thought would look interesting. So knowing that we were able to do that trip, we had more than a year before we were gonna leave when we knew it was gonna happen. And we spent that year doing the most insane amount of research that we could do. We pulled out maps, figured out train routes. We got uh, Rick Steve's Best of Europe watched every single episode, every single one of them more than once, or at least every one that was relevant, uh, talked and talked and talked and got guidebooks, uh, which are not very useful today, but uh, they were back then. And we looked up every location and everything we were interested in. And we said, here are the places. And we talked and there would be places that I'm like, this seems really cool. She'd be like, nope, I know why I don't want to go there. And we'd narrow it down. And then the opposite, she'd say, well, what about this place? I'd be like, I'm not interested in that place. And we ended up with a nice long list of places that we both thought looked interesting. And we were both willing to go and, and spend a little bit of time to get to know. And then we went to Europe with our kids and put in a lot of time going from country to country and region to region and city to city and seeing lots of places. And some places that were very high on our potential move list, just got taken right off. We had no idea that we just weren't gonna feel it when we got there. And some places that we ended up accidentally going to that we didn't even expect to have on our final transit list, but there was a there was a landslide and a train had to be rerouted to a flight and we just ended up in a city we didn't expect. 
and it ended up being the one that completely changed our long-term travel and relocation plans, it, sometimes these things just come together, but we learn so much about ourselves, about places we like, about different options, like there's whole feelings of, well, this country feels this way or this region feels this way, and we didn't imagine it would be like that or how it would be different from the ones next to it. And uh, it was just an amazing fact-finding mission, and that helped us narrow things down a lot. And then after a little bit of time after that, because we did have to do some career maneuvering uh, at the time, or again, thought that we did, then we were able to make the decision, okay, we're gonna start living abroad. And unlike most people who just move to their final country and take their chances, we ended up moving to eight different countries. Well, one that we started in and seven additional countries that we went and explored. Plus growing up, I lived in many, many different regions uh, of, of my home country. And we went to uh, many countries across Europe and then ended up in a few in Latin America and really just explored broadly by actually living in those countries. Of course, we had visited many, many countries uh, and put in little bits of time all over. So we had, you know, a, a good foundation in what we would likely like. And then we put in some big serious time. In some cases, we thought that they were locations that we really wanted to consider as a permanent home. And in other cases, we looked at places that we didn't think would be a permanent consideration, but we really wanted to give it a nice long period of time and get to live there, even if it was temporary. And that uh, exploration process was unbelievably valuable. And the place that we ended up choosing after doing tons of research, putting in nearly a decade of continuous work trying to narrow this down, I don't recommend spending a decade to do this, but the adventure of living in lots of different countries was one thing that we wanted. We wanted our children to have the ability to grow up with a kind of worldview and not be narrowly uh, educated in just one region just one area. And so that was actually part of our goal. And that's one of the reasons some of the countries we went to weren't places that we would consider as long-term homes, but we certainly considered as short-term homes. We think they were super valuable. And some of those were our, some of our favorite places to be, but we still wouldn't make the decision to purchase a house there and live long-term. In some cases, we may not have an easy right to do so. In some cases, it's a language barrier that we think would be way too much and, and too hard for us. And in some cases, it's just in an area that well, honestly, in one in one case, it's war-torn now, and in another case, uh, they're just you know too far from other places we want to be and travel to and from would be difficult. Where we finally ended up after about 10 years of doing tons of research and finally saying, you know what, we need to pull up our roots, move out of our home country completely. We had given up our houses. We weren't living in it for a very long time, but we had always kept a storage unit, our stuff, and we kind of had one foot in our home country and one foot traveling around the world. We were leaning on the one traveling around the world, but the other foot was still back there. And after time, we said, you know, it's time to pull the trigger and find a new home. And whatever we're going to do, any travel, any living abroad, we're going to keep one foot in our new country and then another foot in wherever we're traveling to. And so that took a long time. And when we made that decision, we did so, uh, I think, with a lot of intent, a lot of planning, tons of discussion, years of, of testing. And it is one of the countries we had lived in. We had tested the waters, and when we returned, and this is where we are now and have been for quite some time, we came back knowing that the country was right for us, but the city we had lived in was wrong, and we tried a new city with lots of research to try to narrow down the right city to be in, and we got the city right. We didn't get the exact location within the city right. We've moved around a few you know, times within that city and narrowed down exactly where we want to be in the city zone. And we think where we've ended up is really fantastic. You can see the beautiful garden that we're living in here. And it's been this amazing experience. And so that is my background. I know that was long winded, but I think it's important to to understand one, the, the actual process we went through of trying to narrow this down, no, it was much longer than it needed to be. If we had decided we were going to move right away uh, and we knew that we could have moved right away, we would have done it much faster. Maybe taking that 10 years down to 18 months to two years. We definitely could have compressed it extremely. But we didn't know exactly what our options were. Back then, being able to look up all these things on the internet was not as good. It was still there. It just wasn't as easy. And... Uh, it, it, we just had, we thought we were looking at moving places that were really difficult and was going to take a lot of paperwork. And in some cases, that's going to be the right thing for you. But the sooner you figure out what that paperwork is and get started on it and, and know what you need to do to get there, the sooner you'll be able to do what you want to do. For us, the places that, that we, the, the place that we ended up eventually moving to, we could have moved to on the very first day that we started. Had we had all the knowledge that we have now, we could have gone back to the very first day where we said, hey, let's start investigating the world. We have nothing lined up. We could have, instead of looking at things, gotten a plane, come here and just moved. But that doesn't work for everyone. It doesn't work for, for most people. So now that we know that though, we do know that starting the adventure is something we could have done uh, a lot sooner had we really understood what our options were. 
So obviously effort and due diligence are important aspects of this process. That goes without saying, and probably you've already thought of that. But actually realizing that it's something you really need to do rather than simply getting excited about a new place and, and jumping and, and not doing your research may not be something that you're really prepared to stop yourself. So many people that I talk to have a tendency to either go, go whole hog towards just an emotional reaction, uh, and on the other side, they tend to go into decision paralysis and never make a decision because it just all seems overwhelming. And there's got to be a happy medium. Now, for regular viewers of my channel, you know that I'm like, hey, I if you're interested in the place that I live in, which we're not even going to discuss because it's not relevant to today's discussion, but it's one that you can come to quite easily. So we're often saying, hey, just get on a plane. If this is a place you think, if you already have determined it's on your short list, which in theory, in some cases, you could make a short list in a number of hours. And if a place that's on your short list is really, really promising and it checks all the boxes that you can determine are correct and you could just get on a plane and be there later this afternoon and make a really solid decision by firsthand uh, learning about it and it wasn't going to cost you an arm and a leg it might actually save you money might actually make your life easier just by doing that well okay then that could be a part of good decision making uh, by gathering more information faster but if other places are very hard very expensive and you need to do more research do so but do so deliberately do so with, with real progress, and then once you get to the point where you can't go any further remotely, get on a plane and go figure things out firsthand. But okay, so when we're looking at the factors, what we need to be thinking about is factors that affect you every day. And there's a, there's a few that are just very universal and affect almost all people. There's a few people who will fall outside of these uh, guidelines for nearly any given factor, but in general, these are big ones. One is, and this is the absolute killer, for most people, is cost of living. It doesn't matter who you are until you're like a billionaire. The cost of living in a country that you're going to be going to is probably a factor in the quality of life you will have there, whether it's the quality of the life that you will have or the quality of life you could have or how soon you could get there or your ability to retire or whatever. It's, it's unless you have so much money that you don't need this channel and you could just fly anywhere in your private jet and go experience it firsthand and you never need like and billionaires kind of live their own world. It's like they don't even have national boundaries. So it's kind of irrelevant to them. They're, they're basing their decisions based off of tax decisions and nothing else. And their accountants making it for them, not me. So outside of that, for normal people, cost of living is a huge driver in, uh, in everything you're going to do with relocation. So, so make sure that you're really you know, marking this down. Unless you're sure it doesn't matter to you, cost of living needs to be compared. Weather and climate, this is big. And a lot of people think, well, you know, warm places have one challenge, cold places have another, like there's seasons, there's, there's more to it. Think about what you really want from weather. And also I've learned that a lot of people don't have a great idea of what they do want from weather if they've never experienced it. Some people are like, I really want all four seasons, but they are not really sure that they do. For me, I actually hate the four seasons. I really like having one place that's the same all the time, but your mileage will vary. And I prefer places that are pretty cold, but I can put up with places that are pretty hot, like the tropics where I live, as long as the temperature is even, which it is here, so I'm fine but it's not the perfect weather for me, that would probably be Ireland, honestly. So you need to think about what is good for you, like what your perfect looks like, but what pretty good looks like as well. Give yourself a range, but you may be, like I said, leaving Canada because you hate snow. I hate snow. I don't ever want to live in a place that's going to snow or that it snows regularly, like, ah, dusting now and then. I lived in Texas for a while. Once in a while, seeing some snow, not a problem. But if I have to put up with it, I need, like, if I want to be able to just say, oh, I'm not going out today, it snowed, Fine. I don't want to deal with the dirt. I don't want to deal with the mud. I don't want to deal with slipping cars. I don't want to deal with it. I learned that about myself. So that was one of my rules. You also want to think about uh, places where you're going to potentially, if you're going to travel or something like that, you want to have access to be able to get to the places you want to travel. How hard is travel for you? If you travel regularly, many people who move abroad want to use it as a base, but explore the world. It, the two tend to go together. There's no actual necessary connection, but it's very common. So think about that. I've put up with where I live. I don't have the best international connections with my airport, but I can make do and the other things are so good for me and my family that that's one we're willing to let slide. It's, it's okay. We can live without it. You need to think about the food that's going to be available to you. That's actually a pretty big factor. It's amazing how much some regions of the world just don't have access to certain types of food and you need to make sure that you're going to be able to be 
uh, fed on a regular basis and happy about it. Like that's a weird thing, but it really does matter in, in just everyday life. The other really whopping factor, and people think about this, but often don't really do their research. In fact, what I've found is that most people do exactly the opposite. They know that this is something that they're concerned about, but instead of finding something that's better, they actually go to something much worse, and that is safety. Personal safety is generally what we're concerned about. That is not being subject to violent crime, murder, something like that, or street muggings. Those are things that most people really want to avoid. And if we can then also avoid pickpockets or th thieving, things like that, that would be great. But those are very minor compared to violent crime. Bodily harm for most of us when moving abroad is absolutely a primary concern. Possibly that and cost of living are the two driving factors for most people in most cases if they take the time to articulate it. However, if you look at most people who are moving abroad, now if you're moving from, say, North America to Europe, in most cases, you're moving from reasonably safe to extremely safe, and it's not a big deal. And anywhere you go in Europe is going to be so much, or almost anywhere, is going to be so much safer than basically anywhere in North America that in that particular case, it becomes a, ah, Europe's just safe, and we stop thinking about it. But if you're moving to pretty much anywhere else in the world, you have these potential for greatly varying degrees of safety, and often it's unpredictable, and there are very few resources that make that really easy to figure out before you've traveled. And even when you travel, you can't always determine what safety actually is. There are a number of websites out there, like Statistica, that will break down uh, homicide or violent crime rates by country in a statistic way, and using that is one of your best tools. And you also want to look at how they're changing over time. Some places, for example, like the United States, has an extremely small variance in violent crime over time. A good year is only slightly better than a bad year. Uh, but overall, it's reasonably safe. Nothing like Europe, but it's pretty decent overall. Getting worse, of course, and not safe enough for a lot of people, goes without saying. But it's not an extremely dangerous country. It just has a very low variance from good year to bad year. But some other countries, El Salvador, will pick on at the moment because they've made such great strides forward. They were one of the most dangerous countries in the world and practically overnight became one of the safest. They're now on par with a European country, but previously were literally leading the pack in highest homicide rates. So in a place like that, you have this huge dynamic change, and you do have to worry that it could, in theory, return to a high crime rate in the future. We don't anticipate that. I'm not saying that you should be wary of them for that reason, but you do want to look at trends over time and say, is this place has traditionally been safe and still safe? Is it been dangerous but is safe currently? And, and just take some of those things under advisement and make sure you're thinking critically about it, whereas you could look at the United States and say, if it's safe, for me, safe enough for me to consider this, well, it's been this safe for or more or less for quite some time. The difference, maybe it's improving, maybe it's getting slightly worse, but it's not going to suddenly be a major change, uh, very likely. Big countries are less likely to have big changes. Small countries are much more likely to have a big dynamic swing. But what we find quite often, uh, now especially I live here in Latin America, so we tend to see and talk to a lot of people who are looking at Latin American relocation on a regular basis. And one of the things that's really surprising is basically, there are exceptions, but basically everyone states that safety is something they're very concerned about. However, when they state that, most people then make a decision to go to the most dangerous countries, and the safe ones are often avoided. This is changing a little bit as El Salvador starts picking up quite a bit with people who are moving there, so that's changing a little bit. But Mexico and Costa Rica get the majority of people who are moving into northern Latin America, but they are extremely dangerous. Well, Mexico is extremely dangerous, and Costa Rica is highly dangerous for the region. Costa Rica is 300% as dangerous as its northern neighbor and 200% as dangerous as its southern neighbor. In the entire southern Central American region, it stands out as very dangerous compared to everyone else. And yet people choose it and simply ignore the fact that it is 300% the danger of its major competitor for relocation in the area and 300% more dangerous than the United States currently. That's something that people just ignore when they find places typically, that are extremely popular for travel and tourism, they will often simply stop thinking about safety. But when they look at places that are not popular for tourism, they will often critically look at safety and consider those places to be much more dangerous, even though they're often much safer. Tourism has a tendency to attract danger. We actually have a video specifically on that. And the two are not intrinsically tied, but there is an encouragement. When you have a lot of tourism, it's just going to bring some crime with it. So it's something to be aware of. But 
use, especially when it comes to safety, don't let something like a gut feeling be or a, a marketing thing. Like, like if you're seeing lots of ads from a place, chances are it's dangerous or else they wouldn't have needed all the ads. Use statistics, look at trends over time, make sure you're looking at real sources that are simply pulling statistical data, not places that are, are you know, specifically targeting one region or another. You want something that's just a statistics site, not a travel site, not a marketing site or something like that. That's a really big factor. Now, if you're going to be working, then you're probably going to want to consider things that are going to affect you long term with that. How is the infrastructure just driving and moving around the country? Is that a problem? Is that good, bad, whatever? Is it safe to drive? Would you want to drive? Would you need someone to drive you? Do you not care? Is there good public transportation? Does that take care of you? Is there internet? Is it really good? Is it fast? How does it connect to the places you need to connect to? This is something that people don't often think about and need to dig into. If you're going to be a digital nomad, you're going to be working from home. Those are two different things, but they do overlap a lot. Uh, and you're going to be, let's just use an example, you work from London, you're working remote, then the place that you're going to move to, you need to not just see if it has fast internet, that's not a generic thing. If the internet is fast, yeah, that's good, but for most people, you need to work to your location. So the question is, how fast is it to London in that particular case? Or if you're a, a worker from Miami like me, then how fast is it to Miami? That's what I have to worry about. So lots of places are fast enough that that, that doesn't limit you, limit you to a really small area, but it does encourage you towards one region or another because it will give you not just the uh, amount of data that you can move to those locations. I'm going to try not to make this a technical video. We have technical videos on this stuff. And again, ask questions if you need to. Um, but latency, the amount of time it takes for, for one little bit of data to get to the location and back are going to affect you. And some of that really affects like phone calls and video calls. Other things really affect your ability to say upload large files. Maybe if you're a video editor, then it's a different thing that'll affect you than if you're a call center worker. But you need to consider that. Are you able to do that? Are you in a country that allows you to use a remote telephone? Most do, but a few don't, right? If you're looking at someplace like the United Arab Emirates or uh, Qatar, they don't allow you to have a telephone or technically any form of foreign communications. Now, they often let things slide, but tools like Zoom or Google Meet or Microsoft Teams are technically illegal in those countries. And while you might get away with it, you're getting away with something. And that's something you should be aware of and consider in your uh, decision factors. Whereas other countries may have it completely open, most completely open, and you can use whatever tools make sense, but you still need to know if your bandwidth is enough, stable enough, fast enough, low enough latency, all those things. So you have to consider those things. Plus power, maybe the power is good, and, and you don't have to worry about anything or it's bad, but you can put in batteries or solar or something and, and fix it. Maybe, you know, the infrastructure isn't what matters, but your ability to have your own power is what matters. And maybe you're looking at being retired and you don't care about how you're going to be able to work, but you do care about how long it takes to say, get back to your family. So if you're going to be, uh, you know, let's just say your family is all living in in uh, Munich in southern Germany, well, then you're going to want to see how flights or trains or whatever are going to get back to Munich and your ability to go visit your family. Or where we live, the thing that normally happens is people would come to visit us. Now, we're not retired, so it's a little bit different. But if we were retired, maybe maybe we're retired and not able to travel. My father's retired. He's not able to travel, so people have to go to him. So his consideration is how easy is it, is it for people to come to him? And if you're going to be doing that, then you want to be thinking about a number of things. What are the flight connections, for example? In our case, it's very easy for where our family is from to fly to us. It's just a few hours, even though we're several countries away. It's only a few-hour flight. It's extremely cheap. It's well under $150 in most cases, sometimes under $100 if they're really trying to be frugal. They can call us anytime, right? We're in the same time zone. That's a big deal both for work and for retirees or just family that's living abroad. We're Sometimes we're in the same time zone, sometimes off by one, but that's it, just this tiny variation. So we're under the same sunlight. We can, you know, my kids and their cousins can play video games online together at the same time, and it's no problem at all. It's not like one's in the middle of the night and one's in the day. These are big factors that could affect your life day to day, and you may not think about it. For us, we live in a very low-cost location with lots of pl you know, plentiful abundance of hotel rooms available. So if family or friends want to come visit us, it is a fast flight, just a couple hours, very cheap. And once they get here, if they can't stay in our house, they can stay at a hotel down the street for extremely little money and eat very, very cheaply. And they don't have to pay for special visas to come in for our family to where we are. That works out. Do you need to have specialty visas? I was recently in Bolivia and they require a very expensive visa for the country that I'm from. And if 
I was to live in Bolivia and my family was to come visit me, it would be instead of a two hour flight, it would be an eight hour flight. Instead of a uh, $100 flight, it would be an $800 flight. Instead of a free automatic visa, you just cross the border. It's a lengthy process at the border and $160 to be able to come in. That's not an insurmountable problem, but it does make people coming to visit you extremely difficult and not casual or you could move somewhere else and have it be super simple. So how much are these things going to affect your day-to-day -day life? That's a big question. Are people truly gonna visit you on a regular basis? Will you truly travel? Are you actually going to work remotely? Put all those things together and determine how big of a factor those different things are when you're making your short list of countries or regions that are going to make sense for you. Now be careful when making these lists because it is easy to start putting things on the list, one, just way too many things, and two, starting to put things on the list that may change really easily. That's really a big deal. I know a lot of people say, well, I really want to be able to import my, my car. And you're like, well, that's the car you have today. Is that a car that makes sense for your life? Like, are you going to actually make your entire life centered around your car? That car is only going to last for so long. Now, maybe it's a collectible and your whole life's about restoring cars. Yeah, that's a decision you have to make. But for most people, and I talk to lots of people who make this specific thing that they said, well, I really want to bring my car, really like my car. And I'm like, you're literally going to spend your entire life living in a country and make all of your moving decisions around that very specific car, not a replacement car, not a different car, not how many cars, not the total amount of cars you could have, not if you can like just this one car. Is that seriously something you're going to use? Would you would you use a decision about that car to determine if you're going to have children or get married or go to university? Those are similar scale decisions. Technically, all of those are bigger than the country you live in, but the, what country you live in is the very next thing. It's bigger than buying a house. It's bigger than buying a car. So normally you have that drive decisions to buy a house and houses to drive decisions about buying a car. There are exceptions, but for normal people, you know, the order of things in life are marriage, kids, university, country, house, vehicle, and then other things, computer, video game console, whatever. So, uh, so, so be careful that you're not adding something in, especially if it's something like, well, I really like uh, going to, a bit, you know, uh, for example, I really like going to big concerts. Well, this country I'm looking at doesn't have big concerts. Okay, but would you be happy going to live music events that weren't big concerts? Oh, that's a completely different thing. I hadn't thought about it. Maybe you would, maybe you would not. Like the two very different things. Would you be willing to simply put in more effort to go to a big concert? You have to fly to a different country, but is that such a big deal given the whole package of things? Oh, okay, maybe that is fine, right? Be careful that you don't make deciding factors based on things you think are gonna be really big, but could easily be worked around. I see that happen a lot where people will say, well, I want this thing seems like it's gonna be a big deal. I think it's gonna affect me all the time. And then when you actually say, okay, but what if you had to work around that? What, given the the other factors in the country you're looking at moving to, what would working around that look like? And sometimes it's very simple. For example, where I live, we have this problem that our main airport, uh, our national airport, does not have great connections to certain countries. And you could look at that and say, well, that's a showstopper. I need these great connections to other countries. And we say, well, okay, yes, it doesn't have great connections. That is clearly a negative. But we have other countries that are an easy drive away, just a few hours, closer than many of the big airports are to me. Uh, so I, I lived in Texas, and when we lived in Dallas, if we needed to use the Houston airport, that was four hours to the northern Houston airport, five hours to the southern Houston airport. Well, if I'm here and I need, in my country that I live in now, and I need to take a drive or take a bus, take a shuttle, whatever, have a friend drive me a taxi to the first airport of our neighboring country, well, that's four hours. So that's, that's the same as the, as the Houston airport. Oh, oh, when you put it in that perspective, I could use, I could do this flexible thing and suddenly I have a completely different way of working around that. Fantastic. So be careful that you don't make a hard line. Think about what your actual goals are. Don't, don't use a proxy for your goals. And this gets into really good just decision-making theory. But anytime that you're making a list, if you want to say, for example, what's really important to me is my ability to travel the world. I really want to travel. That's at the top of my list. Well, maybe you're gonna be able to live in Central Europe and travel everywhere by train and you don't need an airport. Or maybe you're gonna live in a place where you can easily get to airports but they're in other countries, but getting to them is still really easy. There's no problem with the border. Oh, just gotta be flexible and look at it in the big uh, uh, scope of the goal of, in this case, travel. Not in the scope of 
what is the very specific access of the one airport I'm going to look at. Because uh, yeah, if I live in the United States and I live in Dallas, Texas, I tend to think of the world in terms of where can I fly from Dallas. But I talk to Americans and Canadians all the time who are flying into Latin America and they're like, well, I'm coming from here, how do I get there? And we, we say, well, that's not how we think about it when we're transiting from Latin America. We think of how do I get to Miami? And then from Miami, everywhere in Latin America is really easy. Just because if you look at a map sometime and it'll make sense. But people tend to think of, I'm only interested in going to my local airport and buying one ticket that takes me all the way. And I understand why that's easy. I understand why people like to do that. But it doesn't often provide you a connection or the connection it's providing you is thousands of dollars and very complicated and maybe not on the airline you want. But if you break it up and say, well, I'm just going to fly to Miami and then, and it's fine to look at the first thing and see if it exists and compare. But the simple answer is just get yourself to Miami by any means, any flight, any, any car, any, anything. And once in Miami, there is so many great flights to just everywhere in Latin America at really low prices that you just put those two things together yourself, a tiny bit of flexibility and suddenly getting to Latin America from anywhere in the North American continent is actually really simple, but you have to know that one little trick. So get down and ask those questions. We'll help you figure those things out. That's one we figured out for a lot of people. And suddenly people who are spending $1,500 and flying on flight paths they really didn't like are able to come down to where we are for just a few hundred dollars and be on airlines that they do like and they had no idea that that was the process. And a lot of people want to use uh, services like Google Flights and Kayak to like just figure everything out for them. But those rarely have the really good flight options. The lowest cost ones, the ones that have the best routes, often aren't included in there. And so sending them directly to the correct airlines for the place they want to go, suddenly instead of thousands of dollars, they're looking at hundreds of dollars. Instead of very rare flights, they're looking at daily flights and things get really easy. So it's important to think outside of the traditional box uh, and not use proxies for our goals, and in doing that, we can pretty easily uh, pare down the things that we actually have as top contenders for what matters to us so that it's easier to narrow our choices of countries or regions or cities so that we can make really good decisions about that. Now, on the flip side, we have to talk about the things that we probably should not spend our time thinking about when we're looking at relocation. And this is important because... When I watch a lot of videos where people are talking about how they evaluate countries when they're looking at the, the discussions of relocation, the logistics of relocation often become the, the hot topic, the thing that people are focused on. And I understand why. This is absolutely logical because if you're going to be moving or if you've just moved to a new country, a new place, the things you're dealing with are, how did I fly there? What did I do to get transportation once I arrived? Where did I rent an apartment? And what am I doing to be allowed to stay? Did I have to do some paperwork ahead of time? Did I have to do some upon arrival? Do I have to worry about rushing to get approved for residency to be able to stay? These kinds of things can be quite important and you can't just overlook them, obviously. So let's start with the first thing, and that's citizenship and residency. A lot of people, a lot of people get this wrong. And these are things you really need to know. And we have lots of resources free, of course, on this channel. Just watch some videos. We talk about it a lot. Where I live, it is a residency country, meaning it is all but impossible to get citizenship, but residency is very easy. When people are looking at moving here, they're looking at moving without citizenship, but with the ability to live indefinitely. That gives you one aspect of relocation. But if your goals with relocation include and this is important for the first part, do you require a new passport? Are you just trying to move and have a new place to live, just be an expat? Then that is not something you need at all. For most of you, you wouldn't even want. But for some people, getting a new passport is a really important factor. But definitely look into this. Do your research, watch our videos, ask your questions, because it is really easy to get caught up in wanting a new passport and then find out that you've made some really bad lifetime, huge life affecting decisions that possibly cost you outrageous amounts of money just to find out that you either not going to get a passport with what you're doing or getting a passport isn't going to do you any good or the passport you think you're going to get will be completely useless to you in some cases be massively detrimental or carry major penalties uh, that you were not prepared for. Most people, when I talk to them, because I'm in a country where the passport is very weak and not widely available, when we start talking about passports, we almost universally find out that they did no research and don't really know what a passport would do for them, why they would want one, and they're making those decisions based off of an emotional feeling or a, a sales pitch from someone 
around that. So that's a very important thing to make sure you have discrete knowledge as to why you want it. Just wanting a passport should not be, again, that is not a goal. That is a, a means to certain goals. And there are some goals, a lot of really reasonable ones that will generally use a passport as the means of getting there. So there's a lot of people who will want a new passport as part of their relocation lifestyle change. And that's absolutely great. But just make sure that you understand why you're doing it, that it's available, and passports aren't generic. Nobody wants a new passport. You would very specifically want one of a set of passports. Uh, for example, the passports from Spain, Italy, Germany, Japan, Singapore, Mexico. These are super powerful passports that each one's a little bit different, but each one carries really good ability to travel around the world, a lot of safety, a lot of protections. So those are ones that people tend to seek out. Other places such as Iran, Venezuela, Nicaragua, they tend to have very weak passports and people don't go out seeking those passports. Even if they may seek to relocate and live in those countries, they don't do so looking for a passport. So you have to understand the whole picture to be able to know if a passport is an option for you and if it's even something you would want. And a lot of people want it for reasons that they don't really understand. A lot of people want it for emotional reasons. They fear the passport that they have for some reason. Uh, and very rarely is that really uh, something you should be afraid of. There may be, especially if you're coming from one of those countries with a super weak passport, a reason you may want to have a new one, but you want to make sure it's one that's going to meet your needs and not just be another passport you have to carry around. So that's a whole separate discussion. We're not going to dive into that here more than I already have, but make sure you have a really clear uh, answer of whether you need to become the citizen of a new country with all the rules and limitations and tax problems. And it's a big big decision to take on a new citizenship, whereas residency is a, an incredibly casual thing and can refer to a number of things. Citizenship is an excre extremely discreet process by which you are able to get a new passport and you belong to a new nation. Residency is a soft concept of you're allowed to stay in a place, you reside there, and you may do so on a tourist visa, you may do so on a residency visa. Residency visas are non-standard. Every country has their own selection of them. Most countries have many different ones. So it's, it's a broad topic, and the idea behind it is that you're able to stay in a country long term, but there's often many different ways you can do that, and every country is completely unique, so you really have to research on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, moving past the specifics of residency versus citizenship, the other thing we have to think about is the logistics of actually moving into a country and getting established. I have seen a lot of channels where people immediately, and a lot of my own viewers, tend to get very caught up in things like how hard is it to uh, buy a house? How hard is it to uh, rent an apartment? How hard is it to buy a car? How hard is it to file your paperwork for residency? And while it is theoretically possible that you will find a country where it is so difficult to do those things that you will never be able to get a car or a house or whatever, in most cases, those things are absolutely trivial in the grand scheme of things. Not because owning a car or owning a house or any of those things aren't important and aren't things that are going to impact you, but because once you've moved into a country, and this is super important, we have tons of videos about this, you should not be under normal circumstances, wor be worried about how you're gonna buy a car, get a house or anything like that, prior to moving to a country. Those are smaller decisions and they are things you won't have really good information about until you live somewhere and you go through the process. But what we see often is people look into, and I just saw this in a video where someone's like, oh, I chose this country over this one because it's easier to get a house in this one. And the first thing was we think that they were wrong. We don't think they even evaluated correctly, which was easier to get a house in. They just messed something up and didn't look into it further. But importantly, the decision about what country you're going to live in is a giant, life-changing decision. And the difference between the easiest country to buy a house in and the hardest is very small. Other than a situation where you simply cannot buy a house for some reason, and yes, definitely do your research, make sure that expats are able to own property. But as long as you are and you, owning a house is something that's important to you, you should also step back and say, is owning a house actually important? This is a, a much bigger discussion, but owning a house is often one of those things that people make a mistake about. It is, again, an emotional thing that we are sold. Home ownership is super important. But for an expat, often it's a really bad idea. No matter how much it seems like something you want to do, it probably isn't. And even if it is a thing you want to do, it probably isn't a thing you want to do right away. You need to move into a place 
get to know it and really be uh, a good long-term resident before you have the resources, the knowledge, and so forth to make a good home buying decision and to go through the process well. Just it is not something you should be rushing into as part of your relocation. That is a fundamental relocation error, uh, but it is one that people tend to be very emotionally tied to. The sun came out on us there. So when we're making these decisions about buying a house, though, even if we get to the point where we definitely know we want a house, that is absolutely the right move for you and your family. We're good to go. That's what we're going to do. We now have an additional problem. And that problem is that if it's, if it's something you're going to do, there's realistically no place where buying a house is so difficult that you can't do it. And the difference between the easiest place and the hardest place is very minor. So with, when considering how big of the decision it is as to what country you're going to live in, using this tiny one time event that for one you know in one country may take uh, three pieces of paper and it takes three weeks and in this other country it's going to take 10 pieces of paper and eight weeks or 20 weeks but at the end of the day you're going to own a house and you're going to live in the country that you want presumably the difference in oh we had to put in an extra couple of weeks already living in the country already with an apartment already making good decisions. This is just, it just, it's harder in this one country to get a place that is so insignificant compared to the choice of country. Imagine you're, you're thinking about living in Germany or you're thinking about living in France and one has, you know, different food, different language, different culture, like all these big, big things, like different flight patterns, like the, the, the amount that your everyday moment of life is affected by your country decision and your city decision and your region decision. And then to say, oh, this one, takes 5%, 15% more effort to buy a house, more paperwork, I have to wait for a few more things to get done. In most cases, this is all being done by your lawyer anyway or by someone you're paying to do it. Very rarely are you doing this for yourself, whether you're in the US, Canada, Europe, Latin America, Asia, it doesn't matter. You're almost always having someone else do this. Your involvement is generally just hiring the people, maybe a little bit of research. Some places are harder, right? I live in a place where the research to find a house is quite hard. But again, it's a one-time thing, and you've got to put in a lot of effort to find the right house for you under normal circumstances, no matter what. So the differences are so minor. The idea that looking at the paperwork to close on a house, because every country, people buy houses all the time. This is a normal process. Everyone who lives in that country has to go through it. Like it's, it's, it's kind of like, imagine if you're using, well, how hard is it to get a driver's license as the determining factor for which country you're going to live in? Like in every country, it's easy. In every country, it's easy to buy a house. In every country, it's easy to buy a car. As long as you're able to do it, as long as as an expat, you are able to do this thing, it is not a hard thing. It is not something that should ever hit your radar as the slightest consideration for evaluating one place over another. But I know why all these things, how hard is it to ship my, my household goods there? How hard is it to buy that first car, to get that first house? These are the things when we say, hey, viewer, would you like to move to country X and could do it next week? And you say, wow, that sounds cool. That's a neat sounding country. And I do feel like being adventurous and seeing the world. I would like to move to that country. Yes. And immediately you say, okay, where am I going to live? Do I need to buy a house? No, you shouldn't. You should rent. But a lot of people jump straight to, I don't want to do it unless I own a house. And a lot of people say, I don't want to learn public transportation. I don't want to take a taxi. I want to own a car and have it waiting for me at the airport. So I show up, I just get in the car and go. Again, bad decisions, but this is how we feel. And you say, I don't want to have unknowns. I want an official piece of paper that says I'm a resident and I never have to leave before I even get there and evaluate it. Again, generally not a good idea. That depends on the country you're going to, what paperwork they require under what circumstances. So it does require a little bit of specific country by country work. But don't bring unnecessary emotional baggage for short-term, especially one-time events. And residency is one of those ones where it potentially takes a lot of work. And it depends on the country. It depends on the residency. In some countries, you have to do it ahead of time before you get to the country. In others, you have to show up and do it on arrival or you have to do it pretty much immediately. In others, you may not have to do it ever. Some countries allow you to stay without it. Some let you come and stay and spend unlimited amount of time while you go through the process, quick research into what applies to any given country, and then look at the big picture. How soon can you move? How much will it affect you? Which residency or citizenship option do you want to do? What makes sense for you? Absolutely. But choosing a country based on 
just how much paperwork you're going to have to do to be able to stay, unless that paperwork is just absurdly hard. I know of no country where you're able to come and stay, but makes the paperwork so hard that you would ever consider that as a differentiating factor between that and a, and a second choice country. The importance of choosing the right country for you is so tantamount. And these one-time paperwork processes, which very rarely have large amounts of differences in effort. That's, there's two pieces here. One is that it's a one-time thing that is not a big piece of your life in the grand scheme. And the other is that the differences between the easiest countries and the hardest countries aren't that much. So while I live in a country where all these things are super easy, but you can't get citizenship, uh, it seems like, well, maybe you would come here for those reasons. Well, they certainly make it a little bit more attractive and they make it a lot easier for people to sample the country. You don't have to go through a bunch of extra paperwork to give it a try. And that's fantastic just from a logistics standpoint. But you would never, ever choose the country that I'm in because of those things. That would be absolutely insane. That makes no sense whatsoever. They're all bonuses. Once you get here and decide this is a country you like, wow, that's super cool that I have like no paperwork, super easy paperwork, super fast paperwork to do these things that I want to do. Excellent, nice, but it's just icing on the cake. You need to make sure you have the right cake before you start getting focused on the icing. If there was another country that you liked better than the one that I'm in and you said, well, I like the weather better, I like the language better, I like its proximity to my family, I like all these different things about it, it's where I would have a better life. But I'm going to have to, you know, wait two weeks longer to find out if my paperwork's been processed or I'm going to have to, you know, my lawyer's going to spend three weeks instead of two weeks getting my house. Seriously, listen to what that sounds like. But so many people really do because you're so focused on these are the tasks I may need to do, may need to do when I'm first moving to that country. It's easy for those things to become the focus and then be like, okay, but the weather, the safety, the uh, proximity to things, the internet, the infrastructure, all those things, I'm sure they'll fall into place. You know, what language they speak, we'll figure all that out once we get there. I'm focused on this one really simple process of, of doing residency paperwork. That's, that's a very strange reaction, but be aware that so many people have that reaction that when you're looking at a lot of resources for moving to a country, they'll often focus on that. And like this video that I saw recently, the entire video was evaluating two countries that were incredibly different from each other, other than the fact that they both spoke the same language, and even that only partially. They had essentially nothing else that they shared, and yet they were evaluated based on criteria that made no sense whatsoever and ignored all criteria that might make sense in a general sense or in a personal sense. And that's a, a very important point is that what matters to you and what matters to me or someone else are often going to be wildly different other than safety and cost of living, which basically are the same. Everyone wants the lowest possible cost of living and the highest possible safety. Everything else is very well personalized. Well, the climate that I like may not be the climate that you like. So even if we're choosing climate as our number one criteria for both you and me, we may end up with wildly different country options or region options, city options at the end of the day because it's different climates that make us happy. Choosing a new country to live in is certainly a major life decision, but there's two aspects to this. One is you definitely want to take your time and make sure that you are thinking critically, using logic, make some lists, think carefully about what is driving you, and make good decisions where you are evaluating the things that really matter to you and looking for countries and regions and cities and so forth that are going to meet those needs best. It's also important because it is very easy to get very excited on one side and want to jump into things without really evaluating. So I heard some great thing about country X and all my friends are talking about it. There's lots of marketing about it. So I'm just going to I'm just going to go there. That's one of the guaranteed one of the most guaranteed ways to end up with a less than ideal situation. It's not going to be tailored for you and any place that you're choosing based on that is likely to be high crime and low cost of living value, high cost of living overall. And it's also very easy to become very scared and feel like the decision is an overwhelming one that can't be reversed. Neither thing makes sense. You should not get super excited. The idea is great, get super excited, but don't get super excited about a location and jump in without thinking. Put in some effort and make sure you're making a good decision. But don't become scared because if you do move to a new country and you discover it's not for you or you discover another one that's even better for you, then 
you have every option to move again. You're not locked in. Now, if you go for citizenship, that's going to curtail your ability to move significantly over time. Like you can't just keep getting citizenship. In theory, you could try, but it's not something you can easily do. But if you're just moving with residency or long-term visas, uh, tourism visas, anything like that, your ability to move from one country and just move on to the next is extremely high. I've moved to many countries over the years and could easily move on to, to new ones in the future. I'm very lucky that I've found what I believe is going to be my permanent home. We're extremely happy here. We've had very good luck, but we put in a lot of time and moved a lot of times previous. But should things change and we decide that there's a new place we discover, or for some reason this place changes and it no longer meets our needs, our ability to move on to the next country is extremely good. We could be gone in literally a day and move on to whatever country we're going to go to. Our biggest challenge is taking our dogs with us, which is a bit of a challenge, but we've done it before. We can do it again. And they are running around right now. As I say this, they love to be outside while I'm filming. So it's important to balance these things that you don't want to become so excited that you make reckless decisions and ignore really obvious good choices or and and. Be very careful because definitely if you're coming from North America or Europe, you are extremely likely to get very, very misleading from things like state departments and government sites. They're going to push uh, those those agencies have a tendency across many regions. This is not unique to any particular country. They push really bad advice through those channels because they use it to funnel their citizens where they want them. It is a means of manipulating people who are going through that process. So be, be very cautious of those. They tend to be full of misinformation, often just flat out lies. Uh, their, their evaluations of danger are often uh, completely nonsensical use legitimate neutral sources that their job is to provide you information. The State Department, for example, in the United States, their job is to direct Americans where they want them to travel, where they want them to relocate abroad with partners, with countries where it's beneficial for the U.S. to have people, and they will change those uh, directions and, and warnings based on nothing to do with the country that they're talking about and everything to have to do with what is beneficial uh, to the U.S. public. And so it's not in your interest to really even evaluate those sites. Those, those information sources are just terrible. So it's but very important. Do your research and make sure you're going to places that, that make sense, that you're making good short lists, that you're using good criteria. And don't be afraid to make a mistake because you can correct it. That's, that's really important is getting over that fear. I know, trust me, the first time you move, there's a lot of fear and and it really does feel like you're making a permanent decision. And so many people say to me, I just I just don't know. Scott, if I I don't know if I've I've got enough information. I don't know if I'm ready to make this final decision. I'm like, it's not final. It's just indefinite. It could be a week, it could be a month, it could be a year, it could be the rest of your life. The sooner you do your research, do your due diligence, but this could be weeks or months. And then as soon as you can get to the place you think is going to be the right choice for you, maybe you need to go visit these places, just do some vacations, like start trying them out. Maybe you need to just move and see how it goes and then visit other places from your first choice location and learn that way. But getting out and actually getting firsthand information is going to very quickly, this is going to saturate very quickly. You're going to find that you've gathered so much information that now you're into decision paralysis. You're trying to collect more, but you can't know enough anymore. You can do from afar really good research about, for example, cost of living. Ah, country X is going to cost me uh, $1,200 a month. Country Y is going to cost me $1,300 a month. That's pretty close, but X is in the lead, right? You have these numbers. But at some point, you, you need to actually feel the culture, smell the air, just just give it a try. Drive down the street and see what you think. That's going to uh, tell you so much so quickly. You don't want to get to a point where you're trying from afar to do really, really detailed things. Things like how hard is it to buy a house? How hard is it to buy a car? Those things don't matter. What matters is, is this country something you're going to fall in love with? Are you going to be exciting, w excited waking up every morning in this new country and breathing the air and saying, oh, I'm so excited that I'm here because I'm doing that and the people I know are doing that and you could be doing that. So you want to get to that point as quickly as possible and from afar doing a bunch of research isn't going to do very much for that. You're gonna get past the point where that's useful very quickly and you need to get boots on the ground, nose in the air, smelling the air as I like to say in each new country and determine what makes sense for you. So I encourage you 
do your research. Our channel's here. Ask questions. We love answering questions for people. Send in video questions. We really love having you guys on the show. And, uh, and stay tuned. We have live streams where you can come on and chat with other people who have relocated, who are looking at relocation, who just enjoy the channel. Uh, ask questions there. Talk to me. I, I try to do this every week. We do many hours, typically on Thursday nights, uh, Central America time. And uh, I, thank you for joining us here on the show. Uh, but uh, I look forward to uh, hopefully hearing from you guys about your relocation journeys and how it's going for you and what things are your concerns or uh, ex things you're excited about and all that. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel and the work that we do here, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. That directly to me. It's just like Patreon and uh, helps pay for the cameras and the computers and all that stuff because it uh, takes a lot to do this show. It really does. I know we love doing it uh, and such an amazing audience and hopefully a lot of new people popping in as well. Uh, if you would take a moment and share this somewhere on social media, it could be Reddit, it could be Facebook, you name it. Everybody that you get the word out to is a potential new uh, audience member who wants to join in with our little community here. It's such a great group of people. Um, and of course, tell friends and family about the show and I will see all of you tomorrow. And I'm going to do my best. Four videos will pop up on the screen and hopefully they're of interest to you. Uh, they go back uh, the last couple of years and help you explore how the process for us has been for re relocation. We've been here for three years and plan to be uh, abroad many more.